heaven on Wednesday night. We're going to continue to look at what the Bible says about heaven. We probably have three, maybe four more weeks we're going to do that before we start into something else. So uh, if you're interested in that subject. This morning I'm going to be talking about some apologetic issues, and I've been, I've been looking forward to this. I had hoped we would see uh, more people plow into this because it's going to be... Um, uh, I think it's important that all of us understand what the church is going to be doing besides needing to understand what is really going on. And one of the, the things that we often talk about are reasons why we believe in the existence of God. And this is, this is particularly pertinent because people are always arguing, well, why do, you, why do you believe what you believe? Or they should be arguing that, I should say. And we should be asking them the same kind of questions. Why do you believe what you believe? Uh, what evidence do you have for the existence of God? And I think many Christians are at a loss as to give a real cogent answer. Well, I just believe. I just have faith. And yet the Bible commands us in 1 Peter 3.15 to always be prepared to give a reason uh, for the, uh, an answer for the hope that's within us. Give a reason. <coughs> And the word reason there is to understand, to give them meaning. And somebody that doesn't believe in God or doesn't believe, that's not a Christian, gives no credibility to the Bible whatsoever. So how do you begin without using the Bible to give a defense of why you believe God existed? Again, we're commanded to be ready to do this. Every Christian is, is commanded to be ready to do this. So... We're going to look at a, just sort of an introduction to apologetics today. Apologetics is, is that word in, in uh, 1 Peter 3.15 to give an answer. Some, some translations say a defense of the Christian faith, uh, give a reason for the hope, a defense. Uh, so the word defense is not a bad word. It actually is translated as defense in, in many translations of the Bible. We're going to use a word this morning argument, oftentimes that's, that has a negative connotation. If I have an argument with my wife, that may be a negative thing. But to, to present an argument for the existence of God is not a negative thing, it's a positive thing. So don't think that the word argument is, is a bad word to begin with. So I asked this question this morning. Is there objective proof of God's existence? Is there objective proof of God's existence? I got a yes. Okay, I got two yeses. And I'm going to shock you this morning and say, no, there is not objective proof of his existence. There is objective evidence of his existence, and that's what we need to be ready to give, the evidence for the Christian faith. Uh, it's just like there's, there's no objective proof of the beginning of the universe. And yet many people believe in the Big Bang Theory. I happen to believe that God is the banger. Okay, he spoke and the world came into existence. He's the, he, but there is, there's no objective proof. And what I mean by that is this, that science demands being able to recreate um, experiments that prove something over and over again. We can't go back to the beginning and recreate something that that recreates the Big Bang. So when I say a proof, that's what I mean. There's no proof, but there is lots of evidence for the existence of God, and that's what we're, we should be ready to present. Uh, okay, what are some possible reasons God has not made himself absolutely evident to every person on earth throughout all of history? What are some possible reasons? Okay, I'm supposed to live by faith. Can we get a mic, a mic out here for these guys? Uh, supposed to live by faith is one answer. Okay. Anything else? Why, why would God not just make himself evident to every single human being? I could, I could also ask the question then, why is it important to God that we live by faith? I mean, we could keep going, this, this is a regressive series of questions that gets back to the root of, of what I'm trying to get at. Because without faith, without faith it's, it's impossible. impossible. Okay, try again. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Okay, all right. For everyone who comes to him, I feel like that's 
a good answer. All right. Let, let me give you some possible th thoughts here, and we, we should we should think about some of these things. I know these are these are kind of mental gymnastics here, but we're we're commanded to think about these things. I think one of the reasons is it goes back to faith, but I think it also goes back to uh, God not in his nature being a puppet master. He wants to give us an opportunity to make our own decisions in our own timing, in our own way. And he, he, is, he puts, as a matter of fact, biblically, I think God puts a very high value on our free will and being able to make decisions. And if he was overwhelmingly present in everything, then would not everyone believe? There would be some degree in which everyone would believe. I've never, I've never seen the phrase. I've never seen the the phrase free will in the Bible. Just like I've never seen the word Trinity in the Bible. Um, but they both they both have a very. Um, we have a sound reason for believing that God puts a high value on free will because of everything that is in the Bible. But you're right, the phrase, the words don't appear. Just like the word Trinity doesn't right. appear. So there, there's a lot of things we could say about this, but I, th I think that we, we need to understand that there's a, there's a very high priority for God on man's free will. He, he gave Adam and Eve in the garden the ability to sin if they chose, and they did. And all of, all of creation fell. Not only all of humanity fell, but all of creation fell. So I think that's just one possible reason. And the reason I'm bringing this up is these are the kind of things that people often ask, well, why, why doesn't God just make himself evident to everybody? I was watching a debate the other day on the Internet between two believers and two atheists, and this repeatedly came up. Well, why didn't God just make himself evident to me so that I can believe in him too? You know, so we, we need to be able to give at least a possible reason. We don't have to be able to give the reason, but we need to be able to give possible reasons why God may not have done that. Okay, the second thing, uh, are there objective evidences? I've already asked this. Are there objective evidences of his existence? And I would say, yes, there are. And that's what we're going to talk about today is one of those. And I want to tell you a little bit about some of the rest of these as well. Arguments for, formed to defend the faith and to fulfill the command given to us in 1 Peter 3.15, to be ready to give an answer to anyone that asks a reason for the hope that's within you, and to do so with gentleness and respect. We... We form these arguments in order to answer these questions. Okay. Here's, here's 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Honor Christ the Lord as holy. Then it tells us how we are to honor Christ the Lord as holy. If I were to ask you, how many of you want to honor Christ the Lord as holy, how many of you would say absolutely yes? Okay, Everybody, Everybody's hand goes up because we want to do that. Well, then here's how he says that we're to do that. One of the ways we're to do that is to always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you. Make a defense or give an answer is the word apologia, apologetic, the word defense or answer in some translations. Uh, th this is the command that is the primary command. We could go to lots of other places in the Bible and find instruction that we are to be prepared, but this is very concise, very succinct, and kind of all in one place. It tells you why, and it tells you what, all in one place. So the defense can be philosophical. Uh, we're, we've already said we're not going to, we're, we're not arguing from the Bible here because the, the, typically the people we're talking to are unbelievers or they have belief in another faith and they quite often don't give any any credibility to the Bible at all. So they can be uh, philosophical, they can be scientific. We've already said that, that purely scientific means that we can recreate something. That's, that's not what a lot of people mean when they say scientific. They mean natural or material. But you can't, you can't go back and recreate the beginning of the universe. You can't go back and, and give a scientific evidence. That would be to go to a laboratory mix two, two or three chemicals together and say, see, there's God. We can't do that. So it's not really scientific, but when people say that, they're really meaning naturalistic or materialistic. Uh, experiential. 
Here's, here's where most people give their testimony, is an experiential. What's the problem with an experiential testimony to somebody that does not believe? They don't have a lot of experience. Yeah, they, they have no place to start to measure that. They go, well, typically here's the answer I get when I talk about my experience with God with a non-believer. Well, that's very nice for you. I'm glad you've got something you can hang on to. And that's, that, I know that's helped to you. And they, they see it more as a crutch, as a reality. And so experiential is fine if you're talking to somebody maybe that's even a skeptic. But when you're talking to purely a non-believer, somebody that gives no credibility to God whatsoever or to the Bible, then experiential may be a weak argument. That might be something to come back. And when I ask people to give testimonies, quite often what I'm looking for is to have somebody say, Here, here's what... I, I've been up to with God. Here's what God's been doing in me. Here's what, here's what he's been doing for me recently. You know, the, but, but that doesn't make an argument to a non-believer or a believer in another faith. Logical conclusions, and that's where we're going to be this morning is in logic. And in, in logic, there's something called a syllogism. Does anybody know what a syllogism is? Okay. Syllogism. It is an important uh, structure in logic to have a conversation with people about God or about anything that you want to prove logically. So I'm going to approach my, my conversation this morning as being a logical explanation of why I believe in God. Now, the, the, the point we need to make is we need to create a syllogism which is basically at least two premises that are true and a conclusion. Sometimes it's three or four premises, but at least two premises and a conclusion. And that's, that's what a syllogism is. And in doing that, you're creating a logical explanation as to why you believe in God. And then, it, then it's incumbent upon the other person to say, here's why that's not true. They have to show either premise one is not true, premise two is not true, or the conclusion you've drawn from those premises is untrue. So if we can put together in logic and an explanation as to why we believe in God, then it's very hard for somebody to go, well, I just don't believe that. Well, why don't you believe that? Do you not believe this is true? Well, yeah, I believe that's true. Well, do you believe this is true? Yeah, I believe that's true. Well, then, do you not believe that these two things together naturally come to the conclusion of this being true, and then, then their, part of their challenge is to either prove, disprove the first two premises or disprove that your conclusion follows from those premises. Does that make sense? I mean, that's, so this is part of the apologia that we're instructed to be prepared to present. It's, it is, how do I present why I believe what I believe? This is the question we ought to be asking in churches all across the country and around the world. Why, Christian, do you believe what you believe? How do you explain to a non-believer why you believe what you believe? Okay, the, the Bible's either true or it's not true. And if we, if we can go back to it, then it, the Bible ought to be a logical document that we can show these things really are true. They really are existing. So today we're going to look at the, the moral argument, but before we get there, I want to just give you a few others. One of them is, an, is called the ontological argument. Where did it come from? The cause, in other words. And teleological argument, what's its purpose? I call it the watch in the woods format. If you're walking through the woods and you see a watch laying there in the woods, what do you conclude? Somebody's been there, somebody left it there, somebody lost it there. Why do we not think that it's a natural part of the environment. It, has it doesn't. It, it's man-made. There is a cause of the watch. And we, we come to understand that the watch didn't just pop into existence out in the middle of the woods. It's like Mount Rushmore. People look at it and go, well, that's rock. It's a natural thing. But did it just appear, did it just happen that way that Mount Rushmore is there? No, there's a cause, causal agent behind that. And that's what ontology is. Teleology is, is the purpose of it. And the, one of the, the uh, 
one of the things that you'll come to understand is that as people talk about evolution, there's got to be a, a reason for evolution to happen. There's got to be a need that's going to be filled by an evolutionary development. And that need has to be fulfilled relatively quickly in the, in the course of time, or it's too complex. And it's, it, in the Darwin's Black Box, there's a, there's, a book, there's a book called Darwin's Black Box, which Jane is very now familiar with. Um, Michael Behe wrote that book, and he came up with the phrase irreducible complexity, and his example is, is the eyeball. The eyeball is so tremendously complex that by every possible scenario of, of explanation of evolution, they can't, nobody can explain in scientific terms how the eyeball would have developed. It would have taken hundreds of millions of years for an eyeball to develop, why? Because it's so complex and it doesn't have any, any reason to exist until it works. And so how did it develop is the question. It, yeah, it's, a, it's called irreducible complexity. So if you want, if you want to catch a phrase this morning that will really baffle the, the, the pure uh, evolutionist, uh, grab hold of that phrase and say, ask them th this question. Well, isn't the eyeball irreducibly complex? And that'll impress them and they'll kind of be blown away. Uh, irreducible complexity is it. But let's look at this argument, the moral argument this morning. It is formed in logic by two premises and a conclusion. And I'm going to show you a little video that is that really puts all of it into very succinct form. And then we're going to come back and take the video apart and look at it in its pieces. So... The premises are objective, in other words, they're not just, I think this is right, or, you know, Cindy doesn't think it's right, or it's true. Uh, they're, they're objective. And what is an objective reality? An objective reality is something that's not true here and untrue somewhere else. It's objective. The sun came up this morning. It came up in China this morning. Okay? It, it, it came up. Uh, they're objective realities and produce objective conclusions. The challenge for the atheists is to defeat the arguments, either, either one of the premises or the conclusion, uh, to show that they're not both true. So here, here is that little video. Just watch it and, and uh, listen carefully. There's going to be two different men's pictures shown up here. Listen carefully to their statements because both of them are devout, strong atheists. But listen to what they say concerning some of these things. Can you be good without God? Let's find out. Absolutely astounding. There you have it. Undeniable proof that you can be good without believing in God. But wait. The question isn't, can you be good without believing in God? The question is, can you be good without God? See, here's the problem. If there is no God, what basis remains for objective good or bad, right or wrong? If God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. And here's why. Without some objective reference point, we have no way of saying that something is really up or down. God's nature provides an objective reference point for moral values. It's the standard against which all actions and decisions are measured. But if there's no God, there's no objective reference point. All we're left with is one person's viewpoint, which is no more valid than anyone else's viewpoint. This kind of morality is subjective, not objective. It's like a preference for strawberry ice cream. The preference is in the subject, not the object. So it doesn't apply to other people. In the same way, Subjective morality applies only to the subject. It's not valid or binding for anyone else. So, in a world without God, there can be no evil and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. God has expressed his moral nature to us as commands. These provide the basis for moral duties. For example, God's essential attribute of love is expressed in his command to love your neighbor as yourself. 
This command provides a foundation upon which we can affirm the objective goodness of generosity, self-sacrifice, and equality. And we can condemn as objectively evil greed, abuse, and discrimination. This raises a problem. Is something good just because God wills it, or does God will something because it is good? The answer is neither one. Rather, God wills something because He is good. God is the standard of moral values, just as a live musical performance is the standard for a high-fidelity recording. Without your love. The more a recording sounds like the original, the better it is. Likewise, the more closely a moral action conforms to God's nature, the better it is. But if atheism is true, there is no ultimate standard. So there can be no moral obligations or duties. Who or what lays such duties upon us? No one. Remember, for the atheist, humans are just accidents of nature, highly evolved animals. But animals have no moral obligations to one another. When a cat kills a mouse, it hasn't done anything morally wrong. The cat's just being a cat. If God doesn't exist, we should view human behavior in the same way. No action should be considered morally right or wrong. But the problem is, good and bad, right and wrong, do exist. Just as our sense experience convinces us that the physical world is objectively real, oh. our moral experience convinces us that moral values are objectively real. Every time you say, Hey, that's not fair. That's wrong. That's an injustice. You affirm your belief in the existence of objective morals. We're well aware that child abuse, racial discrimination, and terrorism are wrong for everybody, always. Is this just a personal preference or opinion? No. The man who says that it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. What all this amounts to then is a moral argument for the existence of God. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. But objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God exists. Atheism fails to provide a foundation for the moral reality every one of us experiences every day. In fact, the existence of objective morality points us directly to the existence of God. I knew that would surprise you. <laughs> yeah, th this is uh, um, the guy that produced this, William Lane Craig, is a guy that I traveled with in Africa a couple of years ago. And uh, he's usually so brainy he can't, he can't talk to a normal person. But I, I think this is a really good piece. Okay, so here's the moral argument. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Why? Is this true? So we, ha we have to be able to say it's objectively true. Is it, is it objectively true? Okay, this, this thing started with the atheist being good. Okay. So can, can atheists be good? Sure they can. Sure, they, they absolutely can. But not without God. But not without God. And that, that's exactly true. Why? They have they can they can be good, but they have no they have no reason or foundation upon which to base anything that they say is good or evil, bad. Who is say, who says so? Well, I, I think this is good. I mean, you might talk to a, a child abuser, and they say, "Well, I think child abuse is fine," but. Objectively, we know that that's not fine. In, in, instinctively, written upon the hearts of every man is the knowledge that this does, is not right. So, but do, who writes that upon the hearts of man? Why is that not just my opinion? Why, why, why is it never right to, uh, to abuse children for fun? 
it's, it's wrong, but why? Why is it just wrong? It's objectively wrong, and all of us seem to know it, but why is that? The argument is that God has to be the moral lawgiver in order for us to have a moral law that is written upon the hearts of every man, no matter what culture or what system. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, there, there is an objective reality inside of all of humanity. The, let, me, let me give you the, the best one I've ever run across. Uh, and I think I've used this example before since I've been here. Elvin and I once met uh, the guy that was, wh what's the Yama, y Yama, Yama? Yanamami. Never can say that well. <laughs> Yanamami people. He was, uh, he was a shaman, uh, his, his father was a shaman, his uncle was a shaman, he was, he was in line to become the chief of the tribe, and, and I, Elva and I actually talked to him through a translator in Charlotte, North Carolina a few years ago. I have, actually have a picture of Elva standing next to him, he's a little bitty man, and uh, with his arm around her, and here is a guy that was... Um, cannibal. He killed other tribal members, ate them, saved their heads to show off on his coup stick and wear on his belt. Um, you know, th this, this by all measure is a really, really bad guy. And then he came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Here's what he taught. I asked him a lot of questions. I just kept firing questions at him. And one of those questions was, when you were in the, in the middle of that, doing those things, what did, what did you think? What were you thinking and what were you feeling? And, the, and without hesitation, he said, I knew it was wrong. Mm -hmm. Yet, it's the only experience he had ever had. All, in his culture, that was, that was considered a good thing to defeat these other tribes and bring the heads back. Eat the flesh, eat the hearts. That was, it was, that was all that was taught to him since he was a, was a toddler. How did he know it was wrong? The, 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 the morality of it was written upon the heart of the, even this person who had no experiential reason to believe in a God. No experiential reason to think what he was doing was wrong. And yet he said, I knew it was wrong. I knew it was wrong. Instinctively, because written upon the hearts of men, it is wrong. So if God did not, was not here to write that upon the hearts of men, then everybody's opinion would be different. Every culture would form its own set of acceptable mores, and they would all be very different. Yeah, Cindy. What um, was that scripture? You gave us that scripture once. Is it Jeremiah? About that God does place. Yes. Well, I'll have to look it up. I'm not, I'm not sure that... As Carol says, the address. Yeah. I have been considering being in Jerusalem for a little bit from that period. Because like the way they in Palestine, mm -hmm. they have a culture that is very different from ours. Yeah. And it's a culture that has very rigid standards. So Okay, they may protect each other, but they still uh, they still are in the process of eating other fish and to live. It's part of their nature, it's part of who they are. Uh, our our the things written upon the hearts of men is that, that we, we actually have a, a set of morals that cannot be denied that say to, to abuse children is wrong. There are cultures that promote, just like the, the culture this man was from, promoted the killing of other people, but still instinctively he knew it was wrong. That, that was probably the, one of the most important questions and answers that I've ever gotten from anybody anywhere because he had no other experience, no other relevance to judge any of that by but, but his culture. And yet, these mor morals that are written upon the hearts of men seem to transcend uh, humanity. Uh, so it goes into uh, every culture, every nation, every tribe and tongue. I just want to verify what you're saying because of all the, the tribes that New Tribes works with, when people come to know Christ, 
gossiping, they say, they knew that what they did was wrong and the things that they experienced. I mean, like they lived in fear of the spirits of the underworld. Yeah. But they knew that the things they did were wrong. Yeah. They all knew. And, and that's a testimony that, that people all over the world speak. Yeah, people, people everywhere understand it was wrong. It's, um, there is real evidence that animals do um, look out for each other, protect each other, the mama whales, and protect their cubs, and that sort of thing. Does scripture address that at all? Yeah, if you, once again, go back to Jim's point earlier on, there are things that are not said directly, but that you can uh, logically conclude from all that scripture says. And, and one of those things is that when, when man fell, it wasn't just man, it was all of humanity. Before that, the lion did lie down with the lamb. Before that, there, were the, there wasn't a challenge in, in growing a garden. You know, uh, the, there, was, there was a natural uh, coexistence of things and people and animals and nature there was, but, but when humanity fell, all of nature fell. So there is, there is a division there. Today we're, we're, we're pretty much exclusively talking about uh, man. And here, here is the, the problem that atheists have. As an atheist, if you really talk to them any length of time, you'll find out they're living as if God does exist. They are, that's the way they live every day. The, the guy that fell and had the, the, his cell phone stolen there, he goes, he, he could be an atheist and go, wait a minute, that's mine. Right. Well, who cares? I mean, if, you, if, there's no, if there's no reason for a morality, if there's no reason for right and wrong and good and evil, why shouldn't I just take what I want? Mm -hmm. Might makes right, right? Or if somebody says that's not fair. Yeah, it's, it's not fair. So... If it's say not, it's not fair, or it's uh, that's against that's against my my how I believe. Well, so what? I believe something different. There's got to be a foundation, you see, to stand on that is consistent, and and that has uh, no breach in it for an atheist to say that. And that's the reason that the one atheist said that it's just blind pity, pity, pity pitiless indifference. You know. Easy for me to say. Um, you know, it, it's it, because if there is no objective moral standard, a place to begin, a foundation, then everybody ought to be able to live exactly the way they want to live, do anything they want to do, take anything they want to take, live any way they want to live, and nobody should be able to call it right and wrong. And yet, every day, atheists make those moral determinations that certain things are right and certain things are wrong. If they get on a train that says it's going to Chicago and it ends up in L.A., they go, well, wait a minute, that's not right. I bought a ticket to Chicago. Yeah. No, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, you, you got a ticket, didn't you? You got somewhere different, didn't you? I mean, I mean these sound silly, but, but they're, it's very real. These moral standards are real. Objective moral values and duties do exist. So uh, if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Why? Because there has to be a single moral lawgiver that sets the standard. Now, here, here's the argument that's sometimes made. Well, I just don't, I don't think that's God. Well, wh where do you think it comes from? Well, maybe there's some other moral lawgiver. Well, let's call him God, because if he is the moral lawgiver, he's God. Okay, they could say, well, I just think cultures developed this. Well, the argument is, but there are certain things that are right and wrong in any culture, any place in the world. Uh, and the example of the shaman is exactly a, a perfect example of that. That he says, I knew it was wrong, but I did it because the culture said I needed to do it. Yeah, Carol. Once you can back it up a little bit, you can, can we get a mic for her? Yeah. I'll just hold that one. Okay, we, we, just, we need to get it on the tape here. Okay. 
I would say that's right if you define instinctive as being caused by God, that moral, that moral law written upon the hearts of men. Some, some would not give you that definition. They would just say, well, that's within human innate thought process. You know, that we just, we were naturally moral. And, of course, we, we know biblically that every person is born in sin, so we're not naturally moral. And we know by our experience that our inclinations are not naturally moral. And the little children, when they're growing up, they aren't born innocent, as we would like to think. They're born with selfish desires. They want things. Um, so the argument, the first argument, if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist, well, they may not call him God, but they, everybody would believe that there has to be a standard by which we're measuring these things, that it's not just subjective, everybody doing their own thing and, and, and not having any moral standard whatsoever. So can we, I mean, can we say that's an objective statement that's true? Okay. We, I think the, the, even the atheist has a very hard time defeating this. They see that there is a moral law giver. They may not call him God, but they see that there is something that is, that is innate, written upon the hearts of every man, if you will, that, that makes all of that true. So the second premise would be objective moral values and duties do exist. Almost every atheist agrees that's true. Some, like Richard Dawkins, says that no, that they don't exist. You should be able to do anything you want to do anytime you want to do it. And, of course, he'll make that argument until somebody steals his cell phone. Mm -hmm. Or his wheelchair. Or, yeah. You know, so whatever, whatever the, the issue is there, it, it's, it's only an argument from the atheist standpoint until it becomes personal. Mm -hmm. And then they object. So they have a hard time objecting to those things. Uh, I saw a debate one time where... The guy that produced this video uh, just said, well, what if I just w walk up and put a gun in your face and pull the trigger? Is that, is that objectively okay? No. And, and, and the guy goes, well, uh, I guess not. I would object. Well, on what basis do you object? Yeah. What, what's your basis for that? Because you've just said, I have every right to make my own rules. Mm -hmm. So the... The argument is pretty strong, so let's go back and take some of this apart. God does not exi exist, objective moral values do not exist. Uh, we've, we've covered that. God's nature is the, is the key to this. It's not that, as, as the video says, that God wills something because uh, it's good or that he, he, he wills it and it becomes good because he willed it. It is that he is good. There is a standard that's set by his very nature. And that, that is, that's our clarion cry, that the nature of God sets that standard. It's not that, he, that just because he wills it or that, that he, when he wills it, it becomes good, that he himself is good and he himself is the standard. And because of that, all of these things that are surround him here, peace and justice and love and truth and mercy, these are part of God's nature. One of the reasons why I keep going back to who is God is because the, these, are, these are important things that we understand, that all of these things, God is just. Well, if he's just, how can he also be, if he's perfect justice, how can he also be perfect love? Because the nature of God is that both of those things come together in a very perfect way. So that's the very nature of God is the, the core of all of this. So what is the objective moral, the basis of objective moral values. Is it opinion? Subjective? Is it opinion subjective? No, it's not because my opinion doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter if I think that beating children is all right. The, the nature of God dictates the fact that it is not all right, that it's, that it's evil. What about culture? Culture can, can, the cultural subjective realities. It's okay in this tribe to kill the, uh, the enemy and to eat his heart, but it's not in American culture. So, but both are right. 
Some cultural anthropologists will say that. They object to missionaries going in because they think they're changing the culture. And one of the great problems that missionaries have and one of the great wrongs that missionaries have done is trying to go in and make every culture American and that that be the standard of good and evil. It is God himself who is the standard of good and evil, not American culture. Do we get this? So it would be preserving that um, original culture, but with um, Christian standards. I mean, how does Godly, that work? Because God sets the moral standard. You don't have to, for instance, in Native American tribes that we've worked in, there's been a great objection because the tom-tom is so associated with prayer. In the, in, the, in the belief system of the Native American, a lot of the Native Americans who become Christians say we can't have the tom-tom in our service. Well, that's part of their culture, but, it, it, but it's not part of God's nature to deny them the tom-tom that's part of their culture. What has to happen is there has to be a break between the association of the tom-tom with their religion. It's like the feather example I gave before. You know, that people are, are afraid of the feather because it's associated with prayer and have a huge fear. Well, I don't believe there's anything wrong with a Native American walking in the door in full regalia of Native American dress and, and, and presenting a sermon. But there are, some, there are, in fact, quite a lot of Christians on the reservations that will say, that's just uh, too objectionable, I can't, I can't process that. Well, we have to separate the nature of God from these cultural customs. And until we do, we never really understand the purity of the nature of God. But because we come in here and we sit, and we sit in this environment, and we've got air conditioning, and we've got nice padded chairs, and we, we, we sit inside and do church, doesn't mean that you have to have a building to do church. Because this building's not church. I've, I've done it uh, in a desert where there's no plants. I've done it under a tree in Dominican Republic uh, with people sitting on the ground, people sitting on logs. You know, it, we don't have to have these things for it to be church. You know, that's a cultural phenomenon, and it's not, it's not a part of who God is. You know, we've got to divide these things. And it's hard for us to sit and think. It's, it's fine as long as we're talking about not eating the other person's heart. But as soon as we start talking about American stuff, we go, whoa, wait, now, wait a minute, Pastor. You know, we've got to have certain things to have church. You know? but, but, that's, but it's the nature of God that is the standard here. See, it's his nature that is just and right. So to say that it's law, some of the arguments have been, well, we get these things by laws that we have. The, our morals come from laws. Well, that just... The, the argument there, the logical argument, is called begging the question. That begs the question, where do our laws come from, is the next question. They're, they come from, the, from the, what's written upon the hearts of men if they're good laws. Now, we have laws in this country that I think are not written upon the heart of men. And those laws are being challenged all over. Yes, Jody. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can have church anywhere. Yeah, that's right. We can have we can we can go to the parking lot and have church. I I've got a friend that's a pastor of the Cowboy Church in Arkansas. They have church in a barn. You know, it doesn't make them horses. They're still Christians. They're still Christ followers. You know, it's not where we are. But the law begs the question. The law law is given to us by morality. And if good laws are based on the nature of God, not upon what the culture accepts. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's based on his nature and not on what the culture accepts. Uh, so what are our basis for laws? It should be the very nature of God. In fact, there's a, a very good book. I think I got a picture of it. Yeah, here. Legislating Morality, written by two friends of mine, Frank Turek and Dr. Norman Geisler. Both of them doctors, as a matter of fact. Um, you've heard it said, well, you can't legislate morality. 
Well, as a matter of fact, every law written upon the book is attempt to legislate some kind of morality. So we, we do. We, we do legislate morality. It's just a matter of what morality are we legislating. Are we re- legislating what's written upon the hearts of men by God that come from God's nature? Or are we legislating something that man thinks would be more convenient for him? That's the measure of a good law. And I would highly recommend this book. I know David O's been reading it. A uh, really very thought-provoking book. Let's go back to, uh, well, we've talked about subjective morality. This is Richard Dawkins, who is uh, an atheist and written a, a number of books that atheists are raving over. It's interesting that for a while, Richard Dawkins was debating some of the leading Christian uh, apologists, but in recent years, uh, as a matter of fact, after about the first year of debating the, the Christian apologist, he re- started refusing to debate any Christian apologist. Just absolutely refuses. He won't do that. He's still writing books, and he's still selling a lot of books. But he said this, No evil and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference is what we have as a standard. If that's true, then he has no reason to complain about anything anybody ever does to him. There has to be a standard by which we measure these things. And again, going back, it's, it's all based on this. God, uh, good is not good because God wills it. God is, wills it, uh, no, but not because it's good. It is that God is good. It, it is his very nature. His, he, he provides the standard. And if, if there's not one uh, personal standard for good and evil, then the, the, we have to understand that there is no basis for good and evil that's universal. Then it goes back to opinion or, or personality or culture or anything else. So these are things that you should have in an arsenal to talk to people about. Um, so the atheist says that there is no reason to have any, any of gener- for generosity, for sacrifice, for equality. Uh, there's, no, there's no reason for any of that. It's just kind of a, a cultural phenomenon but there is no moral standard for it. They believe that, that humans are just accidents of nature, that we are, uh, as one writer put it, uh, bags of molecular accidents. Bags of molecular accidents. One, another one said that we're just stardust colliding with stardust. That's what we are. Well. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about the evolutionary arguments maybe at a later time, and, and we'll, we maybe we'll jump on that next week. But if we're, if we're cosmic accidents and there is no God, then there is no reason for morality. If there is a, a constant in morality between cultures and around the world, then there has to be a constant moral lawgiver. There has to be one standard by which we're measuring these things, that the, both the shaman and the priest can agree upon that says, yeah, it's wrong to beat children for fun. Okay. A man kills child, what's wrong with that? If we're, just, if we're just cosmic accidents, what's wrong with that? If there's no moral standard, the atheist should argue that that's okay. Shouldn't they? It was his opinion that it was okay. Why, why shouldn't he just be allowed to do that? Uh, good, bad, right, and wrong do exist, and, and, and ultimately what you have to say to the atheist is, you may say that you don't believe this, but you live as if you believe it. I like your car. I'm going to take your car, Mr. Atheist. It's a nicer car than mine. I want it. I'm stronger than you. I'm going to take it. What's wrong with that? He has, he has to say if he believes that, with, that it's all just an accident and there is no standard for morality, Richard Dawkins has to say that that's okay. That's right. He never, he never will agree to that. And it's one of the reasons he quit debating Christian apologists is he had to come down to this standard. Well, if I take it from you, now it's personal. You know, that, that's when things get a little more dicey uh, in these things. Are these things wrong? They're, they're objectively wrong. 
And in every culture, when you boil it all down, even among the, the guys who are the shaman, they will tell you that they knew that it was wrong beforehand, even though they were engaging in some of these things. It's not just personal opinion. This is another atheist. This guy comes to the opposite conclusion of Richard Dawkins, who is an atheist. So here's two devout atheists arguing opposite points. Roos says this. He says, the man who says that it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says 2 plus 2 equals 5. How can he say that? He argues that, it is, that there is a standard of morality, and here's his argument, that does not need a single moral standard to exist. And you ask him how that can be true, and he says it just is. That's, that's the extent of his argument. See, when we get down to these kind of brass tacks, then the arguments begin to fall apart, and that's where we want to be able to, to talk with people rationally about some of these things. And, and don't think you need to be in a constant defense motion. Ask questions. Why do you believe this, Mr. Roos? By, by what standard do you believe this is true? So there's the moral argument. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Second premise, objective moral values and duties do exist. Even Roos agrees with that. And therefore, God exists. Roos says, therefore, nothing. He would agree that there has to be a consistent, they, he wouldn't call him God, but there is a consistent moral existence that is true across all cultures and every place. But he, he, when he gets to that bottom one, he can't say, therefore, God exists, because he's just not in him. Let me, let me give you uh, an interesting story. There's a guy by uh, the name of Sir Julian Huxley who wrote the um, Second Humanist Manifesto. And he was in a debate, it was the last debate that he was ever in, because he, after this he just refused to go into debate with Christian apologists. Uh, he was in a debate, and he that came to the point that, he, that and, and you need some background on him, he was almost, it was almost commonly known that he was a pedophile. And he, 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 he was arguing for the lack of a moral, a common moral existence. And, but when it came down to a, a, about a three-hour argument and debate went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and it came down to the last thing, the Christian apologist said, can I reasonably conclude that you take this stance because there is logic that you say you believe in leads you to this position, or are you taking this stance because of some personal preference? And he, without batting an eye, he says, my personal preference. There is no objective reality for those atheists that hold there is a moral standard. There is only personal preference in the end, and that is a subjective thing, not an objective thing. So their argument really begins to fall apart at that point. So questions, thoughts, comments? We're, we're four minutes out. Anything? Okay, let's end in prayer. Father, we do thank you that in your grace you have given us logic and reason. We pray, Lord, today for us to grab hold of some of these things that you have given us as tools and that, Father, we would be better prepared uh, to defend the Christian faith as you have instructed us to do. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you all very much.